Donovan and Lauren Moreno. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Kim Donovan and I am the manager of our housing and financial advocacy program. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Moreno and I'm the manager of legal services at the Domestic Violence Crisis Center. Very good. Um, so before we, I know they are going to be helping out tonight um, in the chat, uh, so if anyone has any questions you can direct them uh, directly to our panelists and they will be able to answer it. So if you just give me one second, I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint for today. And Okay. Okay, everyone can see that. Great. So, um, like uh, Eloise has mentioned, today's topic is why don't they leave? Understanding the complexities of domestic violence. So again, we are from the Domestic Violence Crisis Center, and we offer free and confidential services for victims of domestic violence. And that includes a 24-7 crisis hotline that you can call or text, um, emergency um, shelters in both Stanford and Norwalk, various advocacy services from um, medical advocacy, legal advocacy, financial advocacy, um, like Kim really does and, and what Lauren does. Uh, we also offer individual and group counseling and various educational programs for youth and adults. And this is one of the um, trainings that we are offering adults this evening. So thank you again uh, for signing up through the Ferguson Library to participate in this workshop. And we cover the towns of Stamford, Norwalk, Darien, New Canaan, Weston, Westport, and Wilton. Um, so before we get into the content, I do want to remind you all that this um, the subject that we're going to talk about is very sensitive and it can be triggering and overwhelming for some people. And if you find that you are, are starting to get a little upset, please feel free to take a moment, step away from your computer, turn off your camera, take a break, do, ever what, do whatever you need to do um, to take care of yourself. Um, this is a judgment-free zone. So we just wanna first and foremost, make sure that everyone is feeling safe and comfortable. So please take care of yourself. I also would like to remind you that uh, this uh, workshop is being recorded by the Ferguson Library and workshop, if you, any questions that you want to ask, but you are concerned about privacy, um, you can, um, without revealing it um, in the workshop, um, I just do want to keep that, want you to keep that in mind that your, our, your privacies are our utmost concern. We want to make sure that you stay safe, especially if you have any question um, related to domestic violence. Um, but other than that, I think those are uh, oh, other housekeeping stuff. Um, you want to answer one of the questions that I'm that I'm asking um, during the uh, PowerPoint. Um, feel free to use the reaction to raise your hand, and one of um, the panelists can unmute you, or you can just pick your answer in the two ways of using the reaction, and we can unmute you, and you can just speak your answer, um, or just typing it in the chat, and we will read it for you. Um, so with that being said, we're going to get started. So just to do a quick recap, uh, last session in our first session, we talked about uh, the healthy ends to a romantic relationship and some of those things were uh, communication, um, setting and respecting boundaries, equality. Um, and then we also talked about the unhealthy red flags um, or unhealthy behaviors that we would see in a relationship. And we also defined uh, what domestic violence is. So I just want to briefly review what, what the definition is, and then we will go into the different methods of control. So domestic violence um, or IPV or intimate partner violence refers to a pattern of abusive behaviors in a relationship that is used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another intimate partner. So the key, word, key words there are power and control. So just keep that in the back of your mind um, when we're talking about um, the complexities of DV. So 
let's jump into the methods of control. Um, so we, there are six methods of control that we're going to talk about today. There's physical, verbal, emotional, sexual, financial and economic, or technological or digital um, control. And I thought it would be fun if we could learn about these methods through a poll. So in just a moment, I am going to, actually, I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I want to be able to see everyone's reaction. Um, but I'm going to launch a poll and all you have to do uh, is just answer true or false or select the, the answer that you think best and then we will go over it together as a group. So is everyone ready for the first polling question? I'm going to launch it now and I'll give you about 30 seconds to um, answer the question. So true or false? Physical abuse always leaves a physical mark. There's one more our participants and it looks like um, one person said true and three people said false. So this one I mean, share my results, you can see it too. Uh, this one is actually false. Um, when we think of physical abuse, we tend to think that it's just hitting, kicking, slapping, punching, um, restraining. Uh, but let's just imagine for a second that we are uh, in an argument with our partner and all of a sudden our partner decides to punch a hole in the wall um, next to us or throws, starts throwing items across the room. How, can you imagine how would uh, the victim feel in that situation if they're arguing and the partner begins to get really aggressive um, and, and punches, starts destroying property or starts throwing things? How do you think the victim is feeling? And you can either um, type your answer in the chat or you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. We're pretty feeling pretty scared. Yes, absolutely. Yep, right. Scared, They're feeling yep. really scared and intimidated, right? Um, so this is actually that would actually be a form of physical abuse. It's any type of action that threatens the person's physical um, safety. So even though they are technically not putting their hands on you in that moment, you're still feeling really afraid for your safety um, and, and definitely intimidated. Another example of that is the partner brandishes a weapon and threatens to use it. Again, they're not technically um, putting their hands on you or leaving a physical mark or bruise, but that definitely you're in fear of your safety. Another fantastic example that we like to use is reckless driving. Um, and we actually know that teens, if they're in an abusive relationship, the car can be one of the most dangerous places to be um, with their partner. And that's because um, if they are driving you know, down the highway and they're arguing um, and the partner starts driving erratically, maybe speeding, zigzagging um, in and out of traffic, threatening to, you know, crash the car or drive it off a, a bridge or something, um, unless that person does exactly uh, what they're telling them to do, they're most likely going to do what they say, right? Because your only other option is to hop out of a moving car and that doesn't seem very safe. Um, but again, since they're not technically putting their hands on you or leaving a physical bruise or mark, but that is absolutely a form of physical abuse. Um, so yes, that one is false. So let me stop sharing the results and I'm going to ask the next question. Okay, so true or false, sexual abuse cannot occur when the two people involved are married. What do we think? Give you about 15 more seconds to answer. Almost there. Okay, I am going to end the poll here. And I'll share the results. And the majority of you said false, and you would be correct. Um, sexual abuse can occur 
uh, when two people are married. Now, at some point, unfortunately, in our history, um, marital rape was not a crime. However, nowadays it is recognized um, under the law as a crime. But sexual abuse in general is any type um, of pressure or force that one person puts on another that limits their sexual freedom. So that can range from anything from um, from marital rape or rape uh, to um, coercion, manipulation, um, pressure, using um, intoxicants like drugs or alcohol to um, make someone more uh, pliable, right? That's limiting their sexual freedom. Um, it, it could be anything as simple as just asking and asking over and over and over again until the person finally gives in and says, you know, um, fine, I'll do it. Even though fine is technically coming out of their mouth or okay is technically coming out of their mouth, um, there's pressure behind that and then they're not doing it completely out of their own free will. So that is a form of sexual abuse as well. Um, so in this case, if, if for two married people, if one of them said, you know, you're my spouse now and that's just your duty, that's your job as, uh, as my spouse, um, that would be pressure, right? Because they're feeling obligated or they're feeling like they have to and they aren't allowed to say no or they can't say no. Um, and that's a form of sexual abuse. Great, let's do another one. Ooh, okay, so this one's gonna be a little tricky. Let's see how many can get this one. So uh, research indicates that this form of abuse occurs in 99% of domestic violence cases. And I'll give you a little bit more time because there's a lot of choices. Mm, we're getting a good variety of answers. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and I'm gonna share the results. So 75% of you thought it was emotional abuse and one person or 25% thought it was financial abuse. Very interesting. Now the correct answer is actually um, financial abuse. And the key word to this question is research indicates. So for um, what has been researched, we have found that 99% of domestic violence cases involves um, financial or um, economic abuse. However, anecdotally, we could probably say that um, in 99% of cases, emotional abuse occurs. Um, so that was a very tricky one. I definitely would, those are like my top two answers as well. Um, but financial abuse um, is, can, is a wide variety of things that could happen, um, but it is so damaging. And Kimberly, you can probably speak to, to it more because that's what you deal with every day. Um, but it can range from um, not allowing um, a victim to have access to bank accounts, giving them an allowance. Um, it could be, you know, taking out loans in their names and ruining their credit. Um, it could be, you know, um, sabotaging their job by harassing them or stalking them to the point where they get fired and they become dependently um, dependent on them financially because they can't work anymore. It could be, you know, keeping them from, you know, getting a higher education or job training. So again, they become de dependent on them. It's a wide, wide variety, um, but it could be really, really damaging. Kim, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would say that was a great little summary of what and how complex financial abuse can be. Um, it's really just any way that an abuser controls a victim's finances. And I would say with what you're saying about emotional abuse being pretty up there with the financial abuse, I would argue that that absolutely is true. And controlling finances is a way to emotionally abuse somebody and make you really feel like you cannot get through the day and you can't support your children. Um, you're not being a good provider for anybody. Um, but a lot of those times, it's really the abuser causing that to happen. Uh, so I absolutely agree that when people um, are strong enough to engage in services and take those big steps to try to be dependent financially and with their own career and in their own housing, um, it's a big step to take, but we're here to help. And Absolutely. there is a way to be sustainable on your own with the right resources and support. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for adding that, Kim. That was great. Um, and let's do one more um, question. 
Mm, let me launch this. Okay. Oh, okay. So we're talking about um, which two methods of control are closely linked financial and physical abuse, verbal and emotional abuse, or technological and financial abuse. Let's see. Wait 10 more seconds. I'm unsure the answer to this one myself. <laughs> so some of these are really tricky. All right, I'm going to pull now and I'm going to share the results. So 75% of you said verbal and emotional abuse and 25% said technological and financial abuse. Now this one is flipped. This one's actually verbal and emotional abuse. Um, so emotional abuse is anything that a person says or does that diminishes a person's self-esteem. Um, so oftentimes that is that is connected to verbal abuse, right? If they're um, calling the victim names, um, saying that they're worthless, saying, you know, that um, they'll never amount to anything or, you know, that no one's going to love them like, uh, like the way they love them, um, that's verbal abuse but it's also eating away at a person's self-esteem. So that's emotional abuse and that's why it is tied together. Um, now, the only form of control that we did not um, specifically talk about during this, this activity is uh, technological or digital abuse. And I just wanna briefly touch on that. And that's gonna be um, using technology to harass, stalk, um, threaten, uh, manipulate the partner, control the partner. So that could range from tracking the partner using find my iPhone, um, snap map um, to, you know, uh, installing tracking devices on cars, computers, um, installing video cameras or audio listening devices, um, controlling passwords, um, hacking accounts, um, you know, uh, threatening uh, to expose someone or um, send intimate photos. Uh, it, it's a wide variety of things, but it's basically using technology as a method of control. So before we move on, jump back into the PowerPoint, are there any questions about um, any of the methods of control that we just covered? No? Okay. So I'm going to... Zoom slideshow. Okay, so those are methods of control. And now this slide just kind of talks a little bit more about the effects of emotional abuse. So again, it lessens the self-esteem, um, causes feelings of powerlessness or feeling unworthy, causes anxiety and depression. Um, it, it can cause people to have difficulty making um, decisions or relationships or even keeping focus. So that is a lot to deal with, um, to constantly, long after um, those verbal attacks have stopped or the emotional abuse has stopped, uh, that that script is just playing over and over and over again in their head and it can be very damaging to a person's self-esteem. Very good. Okay, so now we are going to do another activity. So I'm going to launch the whiteboard right now. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and let me just pull up the whiteboard. If I can find it. Whiteboard, there we go. Okay, so for this next activity, um, I am going to create two columns. One is going to be a stay column, and I want you to tell me all the reasons why a victim may stay. Um, in an abusive relationship. And then we're gonna to move to the other side. And I want you to tell me all the reasons why someone might leave. So starting with stay, again, you can either uh, raise your hand and a panelist will unmute you, or you can just type your answers in the chat um, and I will write your answers below. So Kimberly, if you could help me by, I can't see the chat right now, so you could read the answers for me and I will type them out. and mute myself that works um we are getting a lot of staying for the ch children for the family okay so like keeping the family together yeah. okay great and what else 
Um, dependency, I think that can be a lot of different things, I would say, that I would say ties into my financial okay. abuse financial. focus. Um, I would say for housing, you know, dependency over, or maybe also emotional dependency, I would argue too, right? Okay, yep. I definitely um, a lot of emotional dependency on that, right? Because you love them, but at the same time. We have a few love. Okay, love. Obviously. Yep. Good. What else? I hear a lot about going back sometimes. That love can be dangerous. Um, it's not safe if I leave. The fear of leaving, you know, what's the unknown? Right. Because you have that big unknown. It might be, you know, double you know versus you know what could possibly happen if you're out there all around absolutely good what else these are great we also, yeah we also have success of their commitment so i think that goes with the family and some of that oh good well yeah. i had one of my first clients um i had someone come in once ask me if she could legally get divorced but not be divorced in the eyes of the church Oh, so even like religion, mad religion, success. Yeah. I think that commitment is, you know, commitment to that person. Some people it's religious. Sometimes it's family, um, you know, family being proud of you and you don't want to let the family down, you know, your parents. I don't have a job. I don't have a home without the abuser, job, home. Okay, good. So kind of going back to that dependency again um, for those resources. Great. What else? I've already tried to leave. So just trying again. Sometimes trying something new and getting involved in services can hopefully be that key. Absolutely. And just wanting the abuse to stop, wishing that, you know, that abuser would realize that they're doing something wrong. I hear a lot of that with clients when substance abuse is involved. Um, you know, it's only when he drinks, it's only when he does this. Um, so I think some people do, you know, a lot of victims have that hope. That it Maybe, could stop. So hope that things will change. And also it's not always bad, right? There are good moments. Yeah. yeah. I think there are always good moments, right? What else? I don't have support. No support. That's a great one, right? So that's no support. Um, and that could be in the financial way of like not having a job, not having finances, not having a home to go to, but also like that emotional support or support from friends and family um, or even support from the community. For instance, what if the abuser um, has like a prominent status in the community or they're very influential or, you know, have a really great rep reputation? How could that keep someone um, in an abusive relationship? Right. I hear a lot of this um, with clients also childcare with no support, not having mm -hmm. um, anyone to help with childcare and being on your own all of a sudden. That's usually a big barrier. Yeah, that's huge, especially if you're trying to. Oh, here's a good one. Um, immigration concerns and fearful the abuser will report them. Oh, okay. That's... I love that, right? Um, and that's a, and we'll talk about this a little bit more about barriers to the immigration population, but that's a huge one um, that they are afraid that they're not the threat and a way that abusers will control um, their partners by threatening to call ICE if they don't um, comply with them um, or lying about their legal status so that they don't actually know what their status is and they are afraid that if they do anything that it could affect that their legal status um, or if they try to call for help um, that they that they uh, will become, you know, known to the police and that that could then affect their status. So Lauren, I just saw you pop on screen. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that so that we can ensure that um, everyone knows that whether regardless of your status, you can still get help for it? Absolutely. Um, our services are free and confidential. We do not report to anyone. We do not share your information with anyone without your permission. Um, and it is um, a concern for many victims, and this is most of them, some of them stay because they do have immigration concerns and they are fearful that the abuser um, will report them because that's one of the tactics that abusers use to threaten them. If you leave, I will call immigration. They're going to take our kids away, et cetera. Um, also, uh, this prevents a lot of people from reporting abuse to the police. Um, it raises a lot of fear, um, the uncertainty 
um, the fear of um, you know immigration being called or their children being taken away. But um, you know we our services are free and confidential. We do not report to anyone. We do not share any information. So that shouldn't be a reason why um, people don't report any incidents of domestic violence to the police or you know with us at least. Absolutely. Thank you for adding that on. Very good. Okay, so before we move on to the leave column, I'm like almost running out of room to say column, but is there anything else um, that we didn't see in the chat or anything or any other reasons why um, someone would stay in an abusive relationship? We have a few more here that are really gearing okay. towards my financial abuse here. We have the car home rent is in the abuser's name and not mm. having access to documents. So really just you know, that doesn't even mean you have to commit to leave by any means, but just having, making sure you know that your name is on these documents if there's ever a case. It's just a general safety plan for anyone. That's something that I've learned by doing this work. You know, I would make sure in any relationship before it gets abusive, if it would get there, that, um, you know, just anyone in general should do this. Absolutely. Very good. Whew, okay, so we ran out of um, room for the stay column, so we're going to move on to leave. Uh, but I'm sure there are even more reasons why someone would stay in the relationship. But now let's move on to leave. What are some reasons why someone would leave an abusive relationship? Got some things going on here for the children. Okay, so children I'm seeing again. All right, what else? progression so to move on i think to and move on to be free right yeah. emancipate yourself mm -hmm. well. to leave the abuse mm -hmm. well to feel safe okay Break the cycle. Break one. Knowing that you deserve more. Mm -hmm. You say to find support. I'm scared they'll kill me now. Next time, it might get worse. Wow. To find themselves, to refine themselves, actually. That's an even better one. You already know yourself, so you're refinding yourself now. I love that one. Yeah, that's really important. A newfound support and resources. Good. Being free of manipulation. I think recently that term gaslighting became so big. That's really something I think about when people think about getting out of that manipulated situation, finally believing in yourself, you know, knowing that you're not going crazy there, right? Absolutely. And for uh, anyone that doesn't know the term gaslighting, um, it is a form of, you know, mind games, lying, manipulation that a person can play. The classic example that I like to use, um, let's imagine that my partner and I are, were arguing last night and my partner called me a name that I didn't like. Um, I didn't say anything about it that in that moment, but it still bothered me the next day. So I go up to them and I'm like, the next day, and I'm like, hey, you know that name you called me last night? Like, that wasn't cool. I don't appreciate that. I don't want you to call me that again. And if my partner is gaslighting me, they'll say something like, what are you talking about? I never called you that name. Like, you must be hearing things. You must not be remembering right. But I would never, those words would never come out my mouth. You're just crazy, right? And if they do that over and over and over and over again, um, to the point where you just start second guessing yourself, and you're like, well, maybe I am crazy, or maybe I am just hearing things wrong, or maybe I am overreacting, or, you know, maybe I am just being too sensitive. So it gets to the point where they're constantly um, belittling your judgment um, and calling you crazy, 
uh, so that you then start to defer to their judgment. So they are, you know, the they control the narrative and what um, what actually goes on. And uh, that it's a very slow way to control someone and manipulate someone. But once you are in it, like it it can be bad. So that is what gaslighting is for anyone that was not aware of that term. Okay. Um, also, to become self sufficient. Okay. Good. No, you don't want to be dependent on someone else. Not that you can be, you know, you can always have a partner, but healthy partner. And I think this is a good one. They're threatening to out me. I'd rather share on my own terms. Oh, this is great. And own your own story. I love that. We are going to talk about barriers specific to the LGBTQ community in just a second, but that is a huge method of control. Um, if, if a partner is not out to, you know, their friends and family or their coworkers, um, abusive partner will use that as a form to keep them um, controlled in the relationship. Very good. Um, any other ones before I move on? To find true purpose. Ooh, these are good. That goes with refinding yourself. Yeah. I just have that refined. These are great. Um, so I am going to stop right there. Uh, but it's kind of crazy if you look at these two sides. Um, how much longer the stay column um, is compared to the leave column. Um, and we like to do this activity to show the complexities of domestic violence because. Uh, there are going to be a lot more reasons to stay in the relationship than to leave. So the, the first question that we asked or the title of this workshop is why don't they just leave, right? Well, right here you can see, you know, a dozen plus reasons why someone would stay. Um, so it's important to understand that there's, it's not just as you just like packing your bags and just fleeing out the door. There's so many other things um, that a victim has to consider when they are um, leaving an abusive relationship. And we're, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but um, that this is a very clear black and white um, example of there's so many reasons more, more reasons to stay than to leave. And I also noticed that in these two columns um, that a lot of the reasons why people are leaving are the same reasons why people would stay. So the first one that came up was children. Um, so for some people, they would they want to stay in the relationship to keep their family intact. Um, and for other reasons, um, they want to leave the relationship because they don't feel like it's safe for their children anymore, right? Um, safety, I saw, was presented on both sides um, for first day versus leave, right? So a lot of these reasons why people will leave are the same reasons why people will stay. And this just kind of, again, shows the complexity um, of, of domestic violence. Um, so I'm going to hop back into our PowerPoint. Let's see. Thank you for all of your participation. That was fantastic. Um, Let's resume the slideshow. And now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the unique uh, dynamics and barriers to the immigrant community. Yes, I think I see a comment there, Kim. No, we're good. That was amazing. Great answers to everybody. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Um, so uh, again, specifically to the immigrant community, um, so a huge barrier that can keep them um, from leaving an abusive relationship is that they don't know the uh, the language. You know, the, they're not they're limited in English proficiency. Um, so that's a huge reason. And if they don't know the language, then they maybe not they may not also know the laws or their rights in this new country, um, or what resources are available, right? Um, and that could keep them in that relationship. Or if their partner is isolating them, not only isolating um, them from like their family back home, but even like of the immigrant population that they share a common language or common culture with, they don't even have that. Um, they are absolutely alone. I don't know about you, but I cannot even imagine being in a foreign country, not knowing the language, not knowing any of the laws or the customs, um, and being completely dependent on my abusive partner, right? That is a huge reason why um, uh, the immigrant population could stay in a, an abusive relationship. Um, and then the fear of deportation um, of themselves or their children, and we, we already talked about that. And Lauren, thank you again for um, letting them know about our services. 
Uh, now, barriers to the LGBTQ community. So fear that they'll be denied services um, or that their services uh, won't be affirming to them. So this is especially for like the transgender population. Um, if they, let's say they're trying to leave an abusive relationship and they have no place to go, so they want to go to a shelter to say temporarily. But if um, maybe they are a transgender woman, but they may not outwardly appear to be that way to society. Um, they could be denied, um, you know, status at, at a woman's shelter because they don't fully look like a woman, right? Um, but thankfully, DVCC um, is affirming to all um, genders and we do not discriminate. And if you are transgender, you are welcome to stay at our shelters. Um, so, Another one that we talked about already is fear of being outed when seeking help um, uh, or just fear of being outed, period. Um, but again, if you are not out to uh, your community and you are trying to leave the relationship, that could be a huge barrier. Um, fear in general, if you are seeking help from services that you're going to be judged uh, for choosing this lifestyle or, choose, or being morally corrupt, right? So you're already, you know, feeling bad about yourself because your abuser is verbally abusing you. And then on top of that, the people that are supposed to be helping you are judging you um, and condemning you and, and calling you, you know, a bad person for, for being that way, right? So again, the general discrimination of homophobia, transphobia. Um, and then lastly, I want to just want to touch on the ascribed gender roles. So when we think of what abuse you know, what abuse looks like. It's typically, you know, the man is like big and strong, like abusing this weakling woman that, you know, very not capable of hurting anyone else. So if you are, um, and as, um, if you are male, you are supposed to be tough and can't be abused, right? Or if you're female, the stereotype is that you are, you know, soft, gentle, nonviolent, incapable of being an abuser. So that can keep people from revealing that they are being abused because they're like, no one's going to believe me. They're not going to think that this this sweet woman is is abusing me, or they're going to judge me um, because I'm a man and I'm and I'm being abused, right? So that's another. Those are some more barriers that keep um, uh, the LGBTQ community um, in abusive relationships sometimes. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, the barriers for um, the BIPOC community or the Black Indigenous people of color. So a huge one is uh, cultural and or religious beliefs that restrain the survivor um, from leaving the abusive relationship. So these are just generalized examples and definitely not specific to um, people, to like one person, everyone has different experience. But for instance, in general, like the um, Asian population, right? They um, very they very much tend to keep to themselves, and you know what happens in the family stays in the family. So they'll be less likely to you know seek help outside of their community because you know that domestic violence is just something that's supposed to stay in the family. You don't talk about it with other people, um, or in like the Latin community, you have like that machismo culture where the guy is supposed to be big and tough and strong and the woman is supposed to be demure and, you know, just want to be a, a mother and a wife and, you know, divorce may not be an option um, because of that culture, right? Or um, even in like the black community, women are supposed to be, black women are supposed to be like the backbone of the community and they're supposed to be strong. Um, and, you know, they, it just doesn't allow for them to be abused, right, because it kind of goes against that stereotype. Um, another big one is distrust of law enforcement or criminal justice systems and social services. So, again, if you already have um, not the best experience with these, with these services, you're not likely going to believe that they're going to help you um, when you are in need. And they're actually uh, services, uh, statistics or studies that have, have that have been conducted where black women will be less likely to report abuse um, if their partner is a black male right because they don't want to um, continue to incarcerate them or perpetuate that stereotype right of you know the black men entering the criminal justice system so there it's like so many things that are kind of um, combating combating them and can possibly keep in that relationship um, Lauren did you want to come add a comment on that one um, absolutely. I think that one is huge. Um, the distrust of law enforcement, the criminal justice system and social services. Um, 
you know, not everyone has the best experience when reporting something to the police or engaging with them, um, especially nowadays with, you know, what's going on in the media and around the country. Um, but, you know, I do want to put it out there that um, the Domestic Violence Crisis Center, we partner and we have built many relationships with law enforcement through our all the uh, police departments in our catchment areas. You know, we we work very closely with them and we do try to connect with them directly when something comes up with one of our clients, with anyone who wants to report something. You know, we we help them navigate the process so it could be, you know, a little bit less complicated for them and less scary. Um, but, you know, they're not all experiences are the same. Um, but we do try to, you know, connect them with law enforcement so they can have a positive experience. Absolutely. Thank you for adding that in. Um, so I'm just checking the time just for the sake of time. I am going to jump to the last two slides now. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit more about the complexities of domestic violence. So some additional ones that that should be considered are substance use or abuse. So um, as if the abuser uh, has maybe gotten the victim hooked on drugs, um, or if the victim starts coping um, with the abuse by using alcohol or drugs, right? That could be a way, a reason that they that um, they stay in the relationship because you know they're dependent on their abuser uh, for those drugs or alcohol, especially if they don't have the financial resources to get it on their own. Or maybe the abuser um, is threatening them, using the substance abuse against them, saying, you know, well, if you break up with me, you're never going to get the kids. You're a drunk. You're an alcoholic. You're a drug user. Like the, the judge is never going to give you custody, right? So that could be another reason that keeps um, that keeps uh, or another layer that keeps people in abusive relationships. Uh, the presence of weapons, that is a very real fear. We actually know that the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship is when um, uh, when the victim is trying to leave and that is escalated if there is a weapon um, present in the home or if the abuser has access to a weapon. Um, so that is a huge fear. Why don't they just leave? Because they don't, they don't want to die, right? Um, if they are leaving, that means that the abuser will no longer have control over them, and that's when you see um, the violence escalate. It's when they are trying to leave. Um, relationship between the victim and the abuser. Not, not the whole relationship is bad, right? They had to. There's something about them that they loved, right? Not every moment is going to be abusive. There are going to be good moments. There are going to be good memories, and that makes it more complex. If we think about, you know, the common criminal on the street, if you're walking down the street and you get mugged by a stranger, right, you're not going to have that deep, intricate relationship with your mugger. It's just some random person that decides to victimize you on the street. But when it's someone that you share children with or share a life with or share, you know, memories with, that's a lot more complicated to deal with because they're not all bad and there are definitely parts that you love about them. So that makes the relationship more complex and making leaving more complex. Um, and it often takes victims multiple times to leave a relationship uh, before um, they terminate the relationship entirely. So uh, statistics show that it takes between five to eight times. Um, so even if they leave the first time, um, there is a high chance that they will go back um, and it's just going to be, you know, a make up, break up, make up, break up, make up, break up thing until it finally sticks. So that is another complexity. Um, and it, it, causes a lot of frustration for friends and family, family members of domestic violence victims, because it's just like, why do you keep going back to them, right? Um, but again, it just, we talked about all the reasons why people say, especially if there are kids involved or there are other complexities um, that could keep them um, from ending the relationship fully. Um, and most importantly, not all victims want to leave the relationship. At DVCC, we like to say victims don't necessarily want the relationship to end. They want the abuse to end, right? They love their, they love their partner, um, they, and they also want to be treated well, right? So they may not want the relationship to end, but they definitely want to be respected and want the abuse to end. So that is what we try to work towards. Um, I know it can be like a little like mind-blowing, but uh, it's true. Um, and I guess, again, just talks about the, the complexities of domestic violence. Um, and 
ultimately we just want people to know uh, that victims know the risk and rewards of staying or leaving the relationship. So we at DVCC, we don't tell people what to do. All we can do is present them with their options um, and give them choices and allow them to make the best decision for their life, right? We, going back to the beginning, we said that domestic violence is all about power and control. So one person having power and control over the other. Um, but we at DVCC are all about giving that power and control back. So they have the ultimate control of what happens in their life. They are the experts in their lives and they know what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, so all we can do is present them with the options and resources and ultimately allow them to make their own decisions. Um, and I think that's just really important. Uh, we'll end on this note that when you uh, do encounter someone that is experiencing domestic violence that you allow them to make those choices and that you don't just don't tell them to leave because like I said it could be very dangerous leaving that situation so it's so crucial that they are connected to a domestic violence service like the Domestic Violence Crisis Center where we can offer them support in the form of safety planning and other resources so that we can help them get out in the safest way possible. Um, so next session, we are going to talk about um, how you can help someone if they are trying to, uh, if they are in an abusive relationship, um, and and we uh, will discuss some more ways that you can um, intervene if you are a bystander in those situations. But before we close, are there any questions um, about anything that we talked about today? Um, anything that wasn't answered or anything that you would like us to um, expand upon at all? No? Okay. Well, thank you all again um, for coming out tonight. Oh, can children be victims? Be domestic violence victims. Absolutely, they can. Um, and Lauren, if you want to touch on it a little bit more, you can from the legal side of that. Sure, absolutely. Um, children can definitely be victims of domestic violence. Um, sorry, I'm just, this, this keeps popping up. <laughs> I apologize. Um, yes, you know, we do have many, many incidents where children are the victims of the domestic, the violence going on at home, whether it be from a parent or another per, or another family member. Um, so vic, uh, children are victims of domestic violence. We work, um, we don't, we work with, we collaborate with the Department of Children and Families. But once again, we do not release any information that you do not wish to share. Um, but victims, there, there is no, specific characteristic at, uh, as to what a domestic violence victim is supposed to look like. It does, domestic violence does not discriminate. So basically we have, you know, victims of domestic violence are all come from all ages, religions, cultural backgrounds. Um, and we do provide services for children and adults. We do have counseling services um, for all. Uh, and then Suzanne said, children see, hear, know, and can be targets as well, right? So also if, um, and she said, children can be used as a tool to control the other parent, absolutely. And we talked about some of the reasons why people stay is, is be, it's for the children, right? So if the partner is threatening to take custody um, or run away with the children, that could absolutely um, be used as a method of control. Um, and also if children are witnessing the abuse, maybe they are not the exact victims, but they're witnessing that would still um, be a form of abuse, right? Because they are they are seeing all of that go on in the home. So absolutely, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, any other one? Oh, and then children sometimes get in harm's way, trying to de-escalate. Absolutely, that is that is true as well. And I can add something I see um, from a financial standpoint is abusers taking the identifying documents of children. So always making sure you have a copy of birth certificates, social security cards, anything that would pertain um, because abusers will hold on to those documents so that you can enroll a child in school and you have some difficulty getting some of those essential needs. Absolutely, great, thank you for adding that in. 
Okay, um, so we are going to wrap up. Uh, we are going to have our final um, workshop next Monday, October 26th at 6 p.m. There is still time to register. You do not have to um, have to be a part of part one and part two in order to participate in part three. Anyone can sign up. So tell your friends, your family, your coworkers, um, and hopefully we will see you all next week. All right, thank you everyone. Thanks. Have a great yeah. night. Bye.